So thank you all for joining us for the Stockbridge Library's online poetry series entitled Medicine for the Soul. Um, we are in week 55, which is amazing, um, as we thought we would have a one month series of poetry readings. Um, we've had some amazing poets join us. Some of you are here today um, to hear another great poet who we have with us today, and that is Dennis Sweeney. Dennis, thank you for joining us and welcome. Um, a little bit about Dennis, his writing has appeared in Five Points, Ninth Letter, The New York Times, and The Southern Review, among other publications. Um, he's a small press editor of Entropy and a former Fulbright Fellow in Malta. Dennis has an MFA from Oregon State and a PhD from University of Denver. He hails from Cincinnati, but is joining us today from Amherst, Massachusetts, where he teaches creative writing at Amherst College and at Smith College, as well as the Pioneer Valley Writers Workshop in Western Mass and Grub Street in Boston. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. Um, it's, it is absolutely our pleasure. Um, we usually start our sessions with a few questions about your work um, and then have some time for you to read for us. And then we'll open the floor to questions and comments. Um, at any time during the reading, please feel free to enter some comments or questions into the chat room. So Dennis, so we have kind of the same questions that we like to ask all of the poets who join us. Um, and the first question is, you know, deals with the beginning of a poem. And that is, how does a poem start for you? Where does the seed for a piece of work come from? Do you overhear a conversation? Are you alone and have an idea? Are you listening to music asleep? Where does it, where does it generate? I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this question because um, I've sort of been asked it over time and my response is always different. I think it's gonna be different this time too. It, it always comes out weird. Um, so my astrological sign is that I'm a Pisces and um, I sort of like identify with this like big fish kind of watery, oceany, um, sort of feeling of how my experience is in living life. And so, so a lot of the times, like I have this kind of like ocean feeling where um, there's just like all this water, all this wide expanse of experience. And I'm kind of, that's like what I'm swimming in. And then sometimes I, I have this feeling of like, I want to respond to that somehow or like do something with it. So I am trying to like construct a metaphor here, but I'm thinking about like, I feel like for me, a poem is when I sort of get overwhelmed by that expanse or overwhelmed by sort of this like massive body of water that I'm somehow inhabiting. And then I want to like scoop some of it out and preserve it in a certain shape and sort of show it to people and say, hey, this is kind of what it looks like or feels like. That's my really weirdly constructed metaphor for, um, for where it comes from. But it, I do think for me, poems begin with just like a sense of intuition, a sense of sort of something welling up that I can't give a name to. And then I have to try to give a name to it because language is kind of like the tool that I have. So, um, so I, I think it really begins with feeling for me, whether that's an ocean or some other metaphor that I can make out of it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's such a great answer. Um, and I will think of your work from that perspective of this huge body of water so that's it yeah well I'm really in the Antarctica stuff too I'll be you know reading from this book the in the Antarctic circle today and and it's all about frozen ice too so maybe sometimes the poem comes from not just preserving the water in its watery shape but making it into ice or something too yeah something more concrete that's great thanks so um on the other end of the generative process, so we know where your poems sometimes start. How do you know when a poem is finished? Um, is there a moment where you say, done, and you you know put down your pen or close your keyboard and put it away? Yeah, I, uh, 
I wish there was. Um, <laughs> I think for me, the moment when I know it's done is when I'm no longer allowed to work on it anymore um, by virtue of it being out there in the world or somebody like wanting to publish it or whatever. Um, and usually that comes after thinking it's done like probably 10 to 20 times. So <laughs> no, I get to the point, oh yeah, this is perfect, it's done. Usually that's right after I write it. Um, and then I give it a week, I come back, I, I realize it's not done. You know, I spend a little more time on it. Um, then, then it's definitely done. And then I give it some time, come back, need some more work, et cetera. And then I end up sending it out a couple of times and, and um, not necessarily getting positive feedback. <laughs> that reminds me I need to continue doing work on it. Um, and then eventually it comes into the world somehow. But it's such a, it's such a conversation, you know, between my past selves and my present self and the future self that I know is going to eventually show up to work on the poem too. Um, so I, I try to keep trusting that future self, but eventually I have to tell the future self like, okay, okay, it's good enough as it is, mm -hmm. but who knows? I don't know. Those features are always manifesting. You know, I feel like the poem changes every time I read it and every time somebody hears it. So do you ever change a poem on the fly? Like, will you be reading something and then change a word here or there? I've done that occasionally for like reasons of propriety. Um, <laughs> like if, if there's a line or a word that I don't necessarily think fits the context. Um, but, and, and sometimes I'll like, yeah, kind of like put something into the middle of a poem when I'm reading it. But a lot of times it comes with cadence and order. For me, like how, how I read a poem like out loud and then what another piece is next to, uh, for me, it, it makes a big difference in sort of like how you hear that piece and how you interpret it. Sometimes I read the title, sometimes I don't. Um, and I feel like they take on different shapes that way. They're probably like minute gradations at that point, but it's, it can be fun to play with them. That's great. So the last question um, is just about the times we're living in um, the past year, year and a half has been, um, to beat this word to death, unprecedented. Um, with, of course, COVID-19 and the increased focus on social injustice and racial injustice in our nation. Um, how those themes slipped into your work or, or have they at all? Yeah, I'm so glad that y'all asked that question. I, I've been really enjoying the responses from other poets about that too. Um, but I, I think the way that I'm thinking about that is that those themes have always been in my writing, but they have been in it in ways that I hadn't understood or recognized really. Um, I think all, all writing is intervening somehow in the socio-political realm. You know, all writing is somehow racialized or like intentionally non-racialized. Um, and, and all writing is participating in some way in these like larger conversations that we're having. And, and so for me, the journey has been more about like recognizing in what ways that was happening in my work. So for this Antarctica book, for example, um, I you know kind of began with these images of my Antarctica. I didn't understand where they were coming from or where they were taking me. Um, but I started doing more research and more writing, more thinking about it. And I realized that a lot of the metaphors of like whiteness and blankness and emptiness, you know, were having um, to do with my own experience of being a white person um, and how some of these narratives of like exploration and adventure that surround um, Antarctica as it's often conceived of also have to do with like masculinity, which is something I'm always trying to think about and figure out uh, for myself as well. So. I realized like in a way I've kind of been engaging imagistically with these things um, and I didn't have maybe the courage or um, the level of vulnerability uh, or the level of urgency that I needed to have to approach them on the terms that were already there. Um, so I think what I am, you know, feeling grateful for in this moment is beginning to develop a language to like talk about that stuff that's happening in my work. Um, while still trying to be open to the fact that, you know, it's, it's in process and it's something that I'm, you know, trying to figure out as we go. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's like my evolving answer to that question. It's in there and, and it's changing. I want to understand it better. Um, and I'm still trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you. It's a great window into your thought process and you know, pretty profound 
commentary on some difficult subject matter. So Dennis, it would be great if you would read some of your poems for us. Absolutely. Yeah, let me set my little timer for myself. So having kind of this, this great um, expanse of time and, and this space, um, it's, it's wonderful to be with y'all in this space and um, to be able to kind of, you know, navigate it as, as, um, as the space allows. And, and navigating is kind of what I end up doing with this Antarctica book, you know, kind of uh, going from space to space and figuring out how to arrange things. And I, I wouldn't usually get the opportunity to read this. Um, it's kind of a story or a framing for this book of poetry, uh, but, but I'll do it today because we have a little more time. So this is something that comes right in the middle of the book. Um, and it's kind of a story, it's a fictional story that frames the poems that um, I will read and that kind of inhabit this book. So it wouldn't be right to call these found documents. It wouldn't be right to call them documents at all, seeing as I came upon them carved into the snow on my last day in Antarctica, where I stayed for the two years following my divorce. People asked, don't you wanna leave? People told me you have to leave, there's a whole world. Only after they stopped speaking to me altogether did I reach the limit of blankness, an opaque white threshold, and call the American base to ready the warm belly of their C-130 Hercules for one further passenger, a cold one, a person who had for a long time not even attempted to get warm. By that time, I'd made myself indispensable to those geologists whose goal was to collect meteorites that fell on the fresh snow of the continent. I'd wandered into their blue tents one day, this is how they describe it, although I don't recall arriving, and asked for shelter. The rule here is that you give when asked. I stayed for seven days curled by a heat lamp, staring at them as they donned their jumpsuits and goggles and charms they strung around their necks or wrists or stuck in their pockets. The tent flap opened, they disappeared. An incalculable time later, they appeared again carrying sealed plastic bags under their arms. I watched with something akin to hunger. Then on the morning of the eighth day, I stood and told the scientists I was ready to accompany them. They were so taken aback to hear me speak that inadvisably, they let me. Someone pulled out the extra jumpsuit and a pair of cracked goggles, and I followed the crew out into the snow. I watched them roam in precise geometrical patterns across the white plain, bending occasionally to look at the ground before shaking their heads and straightening again. Only twice in the course of three hours did they find something. The victorious scientist held up a bulging bag and whooped. The others yipped across the ice's silence. Then they fell into their pattern again. In the fourth hour of their search, I set to looking. In that hour, I found 17 pieces of interstellar debris. I simply walked from one to the next, following no pattern I could discern. Sometimes I sensed a speck from as far as a hundred yards away. I'd walk to it, pick it up. The scientists would rush to the spot. By the end of the hour, the entire crew was following me, hunched in the shadows of my footsteps, struggling to see how I saw what I did. It was not long, as I said, before I grew indispensable. I found meteorites the way a dog finds shit, one of the men liked to claim and I was not yet sufficiently reattuned to the contingencies of conversation to hear an insult in what he said. I suffered some amnesia after my divorce, I mean to say. It was strange the things I did not remember and the things I became able to do. The geologist made a bed for me and a shelf and a space in the hole and the snow outside they called the fridge. The arrangement seemed natural. I woke, they followed me. I pointed to the dust of stars, they picked it up. Every couple of days, someone will gather up the plastic baggies we had stacked beside the doorway. The snowmobile's engine would kick to life, then fade. I gathered that the specks I found were prized, but never that I was prized. Something in me halted before the breadth of the idea that I might be able to contribute. Two years passed this way. Scientists came and went. You need a rest, they said, as only the most seasoned hands live on the continent for an entire calendar year. But I stayed and I showed no signs of waning health. My vision had even improved. 
My eyes, they muttered, were green, glowing, wild. I did not take this personally. I considered the eyes to be quite separate from me. Every day, I went out. Every day, I discovered more space material in this sector and that, and the horizonless expanse continued to work on me. Although I was always walking toward a thing, that thing was always finally removed from its pock in the snow, and it was up to me to find something new. I did so. But the endless nature of the plane sent me barreling forward into an unprecedented experience of blankness. Emptiness is a romantic idea for some people. For me, it was the only remaining way of life. On that day when I reached the limit, how did I know? How does a baby know it's born? The scientists were assiduously silent toward me. The light had drained from my eyes, I felt, and entered my icy limbs. I slipped into my tattered jumpsuit. I folded back the doors of the tent. Wandered out into the snow alone. I wondered for a long time that there were no meteorites left to find. There were only these words inscribed in the distance. They were written into the continent between long swaths of white. I followed and followed. There was ice, the empty sky. There were words and I wrote them down. This page is intentionally left a blank. This page intentionally hints at loss. This page revokes all other pages. This page is a wall, an obliteration a step. This page is without the features of a page, and yet this page is where we aren't together. This page holds a page named after it with no name. Left blank, this page freezes over. This page discovers thinness, a breach. This page is a continent. This page is a door. Thanks for sticking with me through, through all of those. There, so there's these, these kind of strange, um, elements that kind of are mixed into the book. So there are these pages that actually say these things I was just reading. Um, and then of course, there's that long narrative I read. And, um, and in between what there is, is these Antarctic coordinates. So these poems are named after uh, coordinates in Antarctica and in the Antarctic circle. So you can look them up, you can Google Maps them, and you can zoom in on the white expanse to which they refer. Um, and sometimes they refer to a place. Sometimes they refer to a place that is no place. Um, and for me, that's part of part of the reason to give them these titles. Like, what does this naming do for us? What does giving a place a ge geographical location do um, when that place is a place we can't get to, or a place we can't describe, or a place we don't know? Seventy-seven degrees eight minutes south. One hundred and fifty-four degrees west. We cut holes in the ice and sip history out of it. Afterward, they weigh us. The scale doesn't register. They tag our years and send us back. No loss to us. Our steps are lighter underneath the past. The snow gives less. Has less to give. At home, the dome cradles us back into our short, ugly memories. The ancient lies rise and gather blackly at the ceiling. We can't help but cower. Our fathers are there somewhere, breathing hard. Their voices are magnets. 
Our voices are echoes kindling fame. Sixty-nine degrees forty-five minutes south, seventy-one degrees east. I've been waking myself through the inestimable power of boredom, dream and dream until the field is empty, until nothing waddles toward you, it throws up its hands, until the clouds remain mute against the featureless horizon. The world has less to offer than you think. A few chores, the distinct pleasure of not knowing, then you're back to the lion's spread eagle in the snow at the massive slow threat of geological time. Maybe a bear comes up and sniffs you. Maybe a bird pecks at your chest and reminds you there's such a thing as grocery stores, produce aisles lined with flags of underripe fruit. We'll return when it's time to return. Until then, keep your eyes trained on something. The long cut of a jet stream between two sections of sky, a fleck of dirt stuck to your jumpsuit in flight from the permafrost a thousand miles to the north. In a year, it, you, God, everything will be white. This is the one poem I've gotten a little bit of blowback on from uh, Antarctic aficionados or really anybody who knows anything about Antarctica because it includes a bear. And as you may know, Antarctica does not include bears. Um, that's something I did when I was writing these poems before knowing anything about the continent. Um, and I chose to keep it in there because for me, this, while it is grounded in some form of research and engagement with the real place, it's also about an imaginative Antarctica. And so uh, for me, that's that one kind of Easter egg in there that's about saying this is a space that is, it's real, but it's not real. Um, it's a place, but it's a different place. 76 degrees, 50 minutes south, 155 degrees west. The old world ran with unpredictable dogs. The old world was once the new world. We stumbled across ourselves, found them completely naked. Memories of hay fever, of uneven sidewalks, of a garden hose shattering the air. No in and out, no hierarchy, no beginning or end. The soggy newspaper spread on the kitchen floor. Brittle boxes of cereal. So these words that were ostensibly written to the continent in this uh, kind of narrative that I read you at the beginning here um, also are framed by sort of the, these stories of two people who are wandering through Antarctica trying to build a life there, trying to build a domestic space in the continent. Um, and, and this poem is sort of the origin story of the people that are narrating the poems, um, the narrator and the narrator's companion, whose name is Hank. The vans escorted the unwanted to the farthest reaches and dropped us off. On the far horizon were white craniums bursting from the snow, our homes. On the near horizon, the hard-faced drivers dipped and disappeared. We were alone. Nine gave in eventually to the cold. Two of us survived, warmed as we were by witlessness. We lowered our heads. We pretended there was no wind. Soon enough, there wasn't. Inside the plaster cranium, we cast about for warmth. I swayed in my parka. He beat his thighs to bring back blood. Then we recognized, spread on the carpetless floors were the accoutrements of our former lives. The furniture was both of ours, although I had never seen his face. He unwrapped the wool from his neck, his mouth, his name was Hank, he said, holding out his hand. Mine, I said, was mine. This is a poem that we thought about uh, changing a word in because it had been written long before the terrible events of COVID and coronavirus. Um, and it included the word corona in it. 
and uh, seemed almost like too on the nose of a reference. But I wanted to preserve that, you know, thought from a former time of, you know, when this word could mean something to us other than what we've gone through for the last year. 74 degrees, 45 minutes south, 120 degrees west. An article left me head down in the snow, counting days for men who would not fly. The hard heeled tap on ice. The somber household refrain, be gone little beast and leave me to my fear. But not for long, by a serum, by a side of beef, by sandbags, his corona is already beginning to leak. You need a dread in a place like this, something more than ornery tradition clawing up the walls. Ours is fungus, it doesn't grow, nothing grows, this is Antarctica, but we like to make believe. Hank drops a spatula and I shriek at him to pick it up. The mold is setting in, I say, they've got us by the tongue. If I stay in one spot long enough, I can feel the mushrooms growing on my knees tight gray flecks of information preparing for a rain that will never come. They thirst and scrape. The image gets me out of the chair off the floor. Hank was mycophobic back on land. There's plenty of room for phobias here. I keep trying for deathly afraid, but I'm failing. I used to pray for distant relatives to expire for the simple sake of crisis, now I hope aloud for mildew. The Antarctic circle, cold and blithe, shrugs. Its shoulders evaporate into the sky. Sixty-seven degrees, thirty-one minutes south. Sixty-one degrees, thirty-seven minutes east. Let's suppose the world never ends. Let's suppose we're here into perpetuity, cooling heels at the rim of the great gun cold hot tub. I throw in the towel, it begins to sink. Hank dives in, reaching one heroic hand out of the water where he's drowning, the towel clutched in it. Soaked, drying for only a moment before his weight pulls it down to the bottom. We enact the cycles, we buy in, whether we want to or not, to biotic recursion, watersheds, the boogaloo, but we haven't forgotten silence, not with as much armchair in front of us as we've got. The silence doesn't circle, it rather lurks impatient, then jumps on whatever slows. Hank doesn't need a warning, though today the weather did. The clouds began to settle above us and I told them the hard truth. It's for your sake that I ask you to move on. They gave up as I hoped they would. No reason to dance their white dance on white. Hank has his own way of coping. Takes the silence before it takes him. He's like a dog bounding through a field of bones, human bones, nothing the dog ought to like, but he does. You can't help it. You can either love the whole world or push it away from you, and the dog is hungry. Hank will chew on anything that smells like it was once alive. I recently watched this movie that is currently trending on Netflix called The Army of the Dead, and it got me on a two-day zombie movie kick. Um, and, and this poem is making me think of it, particularly that last stanza of it, and think of how those spaces that are overrun by zombies function as this sort of apocalyptic space, you know, that kind of opens up um, the world that we're living in or gives us sort of a new insight into it somehow. Um, and for me, Antarctica also has that quality. It's the space that um, is both familiar, that exists, and it also is somehow beyond us. It's really difficult to get to um, and not many people have the chance to go there and it holds a lot of mystery. 
Um, and so for me, what this project is really about, what writing these Antarctic poems is really about is trying to live in that space for a little while and see what it feels like to um, not just treat it as a place of mystery, not just treat it as this distant place, but to try to make a home there and see what happens when that attempt is made. Um, for me, the result is a little scary. Um, it's a little uh, distant, even in its closeness. And, um, you know, I, I still am not sure what my conclusions are about it, but I, trying to make a home in that sort of distant icy space, I think is, is what brought this into being. So I'll just read two more. 69 degrees, 22 minutes south. 139 degrees, one minute east. Every night we go around the table and give thanks. For the sky, for the snow, for the walls, for the slippers between us and the floor, for death, which will come soon enough, for the penguins, which at least are free. In the Antarctic circle, thanks is bitterness, flung at what we don't have. But tradition dies hard. We swivel our heads to take in the trappings of isolation and find that even they are sparse. Thanks for white, thanks for winter, for the hole in the harpoon gun where the harpoon fits. Thanks for the pits where our eyes go, for where breath travels, for the ducts that allow us to pass daily out of ourselves. Thanks for the rain which high above us turns to snow, a shy gift lies in it, the certainty of eventual thaw. And I'll just read this one last short one um, with lots of gratitude to y'all for hanging out and listening to these poems and, and being part of this space on this afternoon. It's called 77 degrees, 31 minutes south, 167 degrees, nine minutes east. In the, in the Antarctic circle, memory is a lampshade softening the light. The snow is a massive reflector blinding you. No need for cleaning products in a world where no bacteria survive. Cast off. Let me know what it's like on top of the blue expanse. The parade, shadowless. If you can see the mountains, touch them for me. Thank y'all so much. Dennis, thank you. That was... Um just amazing. I had read some of your work before our meeting today and really enjoyed it, but you know, hearing you read it brought so much more depth and also just hearing your, your stories um, around your time in Antarctica and your work um, was really, um, it's got me now wanting to read all of your work to, to dig in a little more. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, any questions, comments from the audience? I know um, Howie had to leave a little early for an appointment, but he was intrigued by your work. So it's a nice compliment. Yeah, I was, I was uh, at Howie's reading last week and I, I was like thinking a lot about his cadence and like how beautiful it is to hear him read his poems. And I was like, oh, I hope I can read anywhere near as beautifully as that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, you you really read beautifully as well. Like I agree last week listening to Howie, I mean, he, he, he just has this particular kind of voice, um, yeah. but it seems to really fit his work, you know, like totally. you have the, the exact voice for your work. So, you know, the, it, there are these different voices, but so perfectly match with what you're creating. Oh, thanks for saying that. Yeah, you know, it actually made me think about, um, so we we got like some extra funding for the press that published this to do an audio book of In the Antarctic Circle. And we, we did that. And That's great. I, it was awesome. And it was such a weird experience to just read the book front to back. I had to split it in two days because I couldn't handle the um, intensity. My voice got worn out. But the first thing the sound person said when we were recording it was, we better use a microphone because your voice is really flat. <laughs> and oh no. 
<laughs> but like I kind of know what he what he meant. Um, and and I feel like there's a sort of like flatness or like thinness or something sometimes to how I speak, which which sounds pejorative, but um I, I do wonder if it gives some like weird resonance to these Antarctica poems being spoken in that way too. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um can I ask a question? I, please. I'm sorry, I was gonna type it in, but I'm too lazy. Um <laughs> So I, forgive me for being dense um, and off video as well, but um, so you, so you were actually in Antarctica at some point, like what's uh, the order of events, I guess I'm, and I'm so curious and I don't mean to, I, I mean, cause I'm, I'm also very interested in the whole, I mean, I, I'm always telling people, reminding people that poetry is not nonfiction, but, no. um, but I, but I'm just curious, like in terms of like how the book evolved. Yeah, yeah, I love it, especially that poetry is not nonfiction. That's such a great um, thing to remind people of. And yeah, this book is embodying that big time because I actually have never been to Antarctica. And so I don't actually know what it's like. Um, there, I, this has been sort of a, yeah, like a completely imaginative project at the beginning and then informed by a bunch of research um, after I started like these, like developing these images and developing the poems. Um, and so I, I'm working on another sort of full length project um, that's more narrative that uh, also talks about Antarctica. And, and my goal someday is to actually have the opportunity to go there. But um, it is quite elusive, you know, in being expensive to get to and often having to be associated with some form of um, research happening there if you if you want to kind of go to the places that you want to go to. So. Um, so my long-term goal is to actually go to Antarctica and sort of square all these strange imag imaginative spaces with the real spaces that exist there. Um, but I also have this feeling of treating a place as an imaginative or like a narrative space, um, because that's what it is for, I think, the majority of people, since the majority of people haven't been there. For me, that's there's still a lot of energy there. And I'm still, um, I, I honestly feel like I'm still working with that like fictional energy. And part of me doesn't want to go yet for that reason. Um, which I don't know, as long as I'm honest about the fact that it's non-fictional, I hope that that's an ethical thing to do. I don't want to be massively misrepresenting the continent. <laughs> so I think that factors in too. But I, I guess my concern is sort of with the stories that have been told about it right now. Um, and, and those stories affect what we think of it, regardless of, of what it is like, maybe. Yeah, and I would say, um, well, I actually do know somebody who's, who's been there and who's worked there. I'm in Northampton, so if you ever want to go, I can, I can um, connect you to this person, but she's not in Northampton. But anyway, um, but I also think that it speaks to the idea that, I mean, pretty much anywhere is is fictional once you start telling your own stories of them, right? So, I mean, it's an interesting conversation. Absolutely, yeah, I, I really appreciate that comment. Yeah, we, and how does, do you wanna say more about that? I'm just like curious, like, cause I feel like I agree with you, but I also wanna hear more about what you mean by that. That any place is fictional once you start telling stories about it. I think it just has to do with, I feel so bad. Let me just turn on my video. No, no, it's okay, don't worry. Here I am. Hold on. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, um, so, yeah, I just think that um, it has to do with memory and how we reconstruct and construct things, um, right? And how, you know, I can write something down and my family can be like, that's not how it happened. And I'm like, it's not your story. So that, that's kind of what I mean. Totally. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, and like inventing, sometimes you have to invent dialogue if you're writing nonfiction, you have to reconstruct scenarios. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes these fictional stories feel like I remember them better than things that actually happened. Like Memory, memory is so much about how we wish things had been rather than how they actually were. Totally. Yeah. Oh gosh. That makes me think of like all the things that I think that happened. I'm like, I have to reassess. <laughs> totally. 
Totally though. That, that makes so much sense. It, and also I think like playing out of our anxieties and fears too. I mean, I, I think that's can be something that fictionality does as well. So it could be something that we wish for, or it could be something that um, is like a worry or an anxiety. And I think that's part of the reason why the Antarctica space calls to me too. It's just like, this is like a geographical, like physical though imaginative space where the fear of like being lost or being stranded or being alone or having to, you know, figure things out myself or something like that, where that can kind of play out. Um, and don't yeah. forget freezing to death. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm scared of that too, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Does other of your work have to do with place specifically? Or was this sort of a unique project? No, that's actually, at the end of the day, it sort of does. I, I haven't thought of myself as a writer that thinks as much about place um, aside from this project, but actually it does. So um, my newer project, like probably the next thing is about going out in the woods and um, sort of doing like, like wilderness retreat type of like hiking, backpacking type of stuff and how the sort of, um, you know, conquering and, uh, trying to like climb the mountain and be the best and be the strongest, how those kind of aspects of that experience have informed my own relationship to like also to masculinity and also to intimacy and um, how having the opportunity to retreat in that kind of way also affects what you're retreating from. Um, and so, yeah, the woods become, become this kind of like distant space also, yeah. But also home too. I mean, I, I think I had um, a chat book about home come out a couple years ago and um it's just I guess it was last year and and thinking a lot about just how that home space is like contains um this was a, a book about like hunting and home and chronic illness and how like physical feelings can inhabit us and inhabit spaces and be tied to emotional feelings and um it's a more trepidatious space for me maybe but it's a space where I feel like ultimately, you know, that's the magnet magnetic space for me. Uh, it's so lovely to talk to y'all about this. This this is really wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you for your yeah. work. Thanks so much for your questions. I think this has been a, a great space for a lot of creative conversations. So I'm grateful to you, Dennis, for reading for us today and for our audience for the great questions. Um, and Catherine, we see you read your work coming up in a few weeks, right? Oh, you're muted, <laughs> sorry. I think I'm next week. Next week. Next week. week. Excellent, good. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you all. I wish you all a lovely afternoon. And yes, join us next week for more poetry.